Good morning, friends. Um, You're right. It's not very often that Lucas and I travel together. In fact, I got in his car this morning, and we're like, we never do this. We never go somewhere together. But I asked him if I could come along on his trip today because I wanted to come and, as Nikki said earlier, um, thank you for being so good. Um, This fall is my 10th anniversary with Alabama CBF. And what that has awakened in me is a season of gratitude and thankfulness. I've been pondering a lot about the meaningfulness of our partnership and the work that we do together. And I wanted to come and give you a personal thank you. Um, First of all, for your partnership with Alabama CBF, for the things that we couldn't do without you, how much you mean to us missionally. You know, I think back to our years after the tornadoes and all the disaster response work that we did together, but also the CBF churches from everywhere that um, joined you in that effort. And my family is from Macon, Georgia, and I was recently in Macon and members of Highland Baptist Church asked me, how is Williams doing? Um, Because they remember those days of painting alongside you. Um, I want to thank you for your mission work with us in Perry County, of all of the ways that you've joined us with Sowing Seeds of Hope and helping us care for the least of these there. Um, For your work around the United States, your mission work in the Rio Grande Valley and beyond, I am just so grateful for. And um, the General Assembly just two weeks ago was in Birmingham, and after the General Assembly, half of our field personnel from around the world stayed for a meeting, and I got to see them all in one room, and I thought, wow, these missionaries... Um, who are here represent so many countries, and they ask about the churches of Alabama CBF, and one of them asked about Williams. And um, I thought, you know, we have an incredible partnership that we do together. I'm still close friends with some of your former pastors. So Barry Howard and I are in a peer learning group together, and I get to see him frequently. And I was recently at Mike's church, and Mike and Mary and I sat for an hour and talked about all the blessings of where God has called them. And um, and then Chris, who has been on mission with us and is such a good friend, and I've been thinking about all the years that we've spent together and how meaningful they are to me. And I look around and I see some of your young people who've served with student.go um, through the years, and I'm just so thankful for that. Um, You've seen some pictures of when you've hosted Mission Summit for us and some of the things that we have done together. And so on this day, when Lucas is going to preach about the faithfulness of the call of Christ on our lives, I wanted to just tell you how much I love you and thank you. Um, And also, Lucas has asked me to read his scripture for today. So today our scripture comes to us from Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. And I'm getting older, so now I need glasses. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest upon that person But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, 
Even the dust of your town that clings to your feet will wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. And he said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. Good morning. I heard someone talking to Terry in the hallway. I was in Chris's office and I heard someone greeting Terry and they said very excitedly, you're preaching today. And she said, no, I'm not Lucas's. I'm sorry about that. Now you saw Terry and you got excited. Uh, when we were, I told Terry as we left this morning, my wife worried that Terry coming long, because this does happen so infrequently, she worried this was some sort of performance review. And so, uh, let's pray together. God, it is good to be in your house together. And we are relying on your promises. We are relying on your promise, especially that where two or more have gathered in your name, you will be there also. So as we have just sung, we believe your presence is in this place. And in the presence of the Almighty, how can we not help but be transformed? We pray for that transformation in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. After my sophomore year of college, I went to work for a summer camp in Rome, Georgia, Camp Windshape. It's actually owned by Chick-fil-A. So if you're a fan of Chick-fil-A, you're a supporter of this camp. And I went, and the first thing you do at camp is you spend a week doing staff training. And so we sat through days and days. It felt like a month, really, but it was only a week. We sat through hours of, of training videos and testimonials and all the do's and don'ts of being a camp counselor. And although I had applied to be a camp counselor, be the actual one in the cabin, uh, they had a shortage of leaders, and so they hired me to be a supervisor of counselors. So here I am, my very first time working for the camp, uh, my very first time working for a camp at all, and I have folks who are reporting to me, so I'm spending this week trying to, to take in all this information so that I can do a good job and hope I can help others do a good job. Uh, and it was so stressful that by the end of the week, I was riding home. We had one day off in between the end of uh, staff week and the beginning of camp. And on the way home, I was riding with a friend and I was telling her, uh, I can't do it. When I go back, I'm going to quit. I can't do this. I mean, I, I was dead serious. I was so stressed out about it. I was convinced I could not uh, do it. Uh, so we get back to camp and all the way back. She, she's convinced by the end of the weekend, too. She's quitting, too. We're both going to leave. We're sorry about the trouble with the training, but we can't do it. So we get back to camp. And the first thing they do is they invite us out to this lake. And we sit down, uh, they take us around a little hike into the woods. So we're sitting on one side of this, of this lake. And it's near sunset, and the camp director stands up in front of us, and he tells us uh, the story that we read today in Scripture. He says that Jesus uh, assembled these 70 people, uh, these 70 helpers, uh, to help him do his work. You heard when Terry read Scripture, these were all places Jesus was intending to go, but he was sending these folks out ahead of him. And... If you know a little about this uh, scripture, the, the number 70 has some symbolism. It is, the, it is the number, the same number of leaders that Moses called up in numbers to help lead the children of Israel. And 70, in the context of when this was written, is also the number of, of nations they believe to be in the world. So there were 70 helpers uh, to take the, the message of Jesus everywhere in our camp director stood up and said, that's you. We, we're, not, we're not Jesus, but we are Jesus' helpers. And we're not going out to the world. The world is coming to us. And here, uh, your job is to help them encounter, encounter the love of God. 
And, you know, and as he's speaking, the sun is setting behind him over the lake, and I swear they had children planted laughing in the forest around us. And I am just, tears are streaming down my face by the end of it. And I find my friend who we agreed to quit. I'm like, we can't quit. God called us to do this and we've got to stay. And it turned out to be the best five summers of my life. I stayed there for five summers. Only meant to do one, um, but it's five because it was just that good. And if I had been amongst the 70 folks standing here while Jesus is giving his instructions, I probably would have felt the same way I felt at the end of staff week. Uh, yeah, thanks, but no. Uh, Did you hear what Jesus said in his instructions? He said, you're going to go and take nothing with you. So you with the backpack and you with the rolly bag, you just set those to the side. They aren't going with you. You can take nothing with you. And when you go, I don't want you getting distracted by anything. So don't even bother to greet someone on the road. Jesus was instructing us uh, to be, instructing these guys to be, to be rude in essence, to be dismissive of anything that wasn't the mission Uh, they were called to. And he said, uh, when you get to the place you're going, uh, stay at the first house you come across that offers you a place to stay. And even if you look over the fence and realize the neighbors have a pool and they're making some delicious smelling barbecue, you are to eat what is put in front of you and you're not to go hopping around uh, to make yourself more comfortable. And oh, by the way, you know, when you encounter the demons and the snakes, we're going to give you power over those things. Um, And at this point, I would have been like slowly inching my way towards the door, you know, waiting for a moment for Jesus to look away so I could slip out. Um, And Jesus said, if I could, if I could just find one more way to make it sound less appealing. Ah, here's, I'm going to send you out like lambs among the wolves. That's what I'm doing. You know, those things in the scripture that are all about devouring life, things that take away the sheep. I'm sending you out there uh, like them, like the lambs um, among the devouring Uh, dark wolves. Uh, As a minister, as someone who has served a church, I have known some wolves. Believe it or not, some churches are, uh, some folks in some churches aren't as kind as you would hope good Christian people would be. In one of the churches I served, the pastor, for a number of reasons, but in order to condense the story down, uh, he was having a a time uh, struggling personally. And he would praise me from the platform. I was my, my first call out of seminary, and he would say, aren't we lucky to have Lucas? Lucas is a good preacher. We just love Lucas so much. And then I would show up to this office on Monday morning, and he would just beat me about the ears. He would yell at me, and I would never know when it was coming either. I really couldn't predict it. It was, it was truly um, unpredictable. And I would, so much so that I would come to the office, and I would be tiptoeing past his office, hoping I had beaten him there. So I'd go to my office and close the door. And then when I would hear him come in, all I wanted to do was slink down behind the desk and cry. You know, like, please don't come back here and yell at me. <laughs> at another church I served, I had, there was a, a woman there, and I had been warned about her before I arrived. She was someone who was, she desperately wanted to be helpful, but she, with the previous minister who had my job there, she had kept a running physical list of all the things he had done wrong. And she may have done that for me too, but she probably ran out of paper. I mean, it was hard, but she had no problem coming to you, or coming to me and telling me what was on her list. And the one, one that stands out above the others is one Wednesday night. I had a large youth group. There were about 100 students that would show up on Wednesday night. So every Wednesday night was like a church service for me. You know, it was, it was a, I had to prepare my sermon and I had to be ready to go and all the activities and stuff that go into being a youth minister. And she came in on Wednesday afternoon and let me have it with both barrels. And this was just like an hour before youth group was to start. And I listened to her, and not saying everything, any, every, if you're really listening and able to wanting to grow, criticism is good, right? In the proper context and given to you in the right way. But this was neither of those. And I did end up shutting the door after she left, and I slumped down next to my desk, and I cried in my office. And then I had to pull myself together and go speak to the youth group. Now, keeping in mind that I was there for that church for four years, and you got about 50 Wednesdays in every year, so about 200 Wednesday nights, and I can only remember one Wednesday night clearly, and it was that one. It was a bad one. But like the story we read this morning in Scripture, it all worked out okay. The the 70 go out, and they come back, and they say, it was amazing. We cast out demons in your name. The demons listened to us. They were so excited Jesus has to say, well, let's dial it back a little bit. Um, Let's be excited that 
we have eternal life. Um, let's not be so pumped about the demons follow our instructions. But that's how it was for me. Even though I encountered some wolves, I look back over my you know, decade and a half of church ministry and I say, it was so amazing. God showed up every time. It wasn't easy, but God showed up. It reminds me of mission trips. Since I've been on some mission trips with some of you. Uh, where we go in, it is hard work. Um, you're sweating, um, you're, you're tired, you're away from home. It's not easy. But at the end, what do we always say? Why do we keep going back? Because God shows up. You know, Terry named off some of the ways in which we have ministered with you in partnership with you over the years a little while ago, and I've been privileged to be a part of some of the work in Perry County. And I've heard of your work when the, when the tornadoes, and, and, I, and I remember seeing posts even within the last couple of years, you know, when storms come through the area and folks' homes are damaged, you open up your building, you've done that for folks. They come and be safe here. There are a lot of reasons why we come, why we love coming to Williams and being with you, because it's so easy to say, y'all are doing such great work. And it occurred to me this week when I was working on this sermon that if no one, if no, if no one has said this yet, and maybe they have, but it's worth repeating, you should be applauded for something you've done just this summer. And that is the, the gift that you've given to Chris and to yourself of sabbatical leave for your pastor. As Jesus reminds us today, this thing that ministers are called to, it is not easy. Sometimes it's just really hard because of the snakes and the demons and the wolves, all those reasons, but it's hard work. And to have the wisdom as a congregation to bless and fund a sabbatical leave is one of the best gifts you will give yourself. And certainly one of the gifts, best gifts you could give your pastor. And as Chris returns, it also occurs to me, I wonder um, what uh, in Scripture you might have to say to us as we prepare to welcome Chris um, and his gang back here. Uh, what Jesus might have for us this morning. And so as your friend and as a friend of Chris's, I offer these three reflections. And it has to be three because that's what preachers do, right? If we're going to make a point about something, it's got to be three of them. We can't just say one thing. Uh, but if I was encouraging, offering some encouragement to you as you look to welcome your pastor back from sabbatical in two weeks, I would say this. I would say number one, let's be good sheep. That's what we are, right? We're all of us sheep in the flock of God. And Chris is the pastor who has been, like the 70, called to help do the work of Jesus Christ. He is the shepherd of this particular flock located in this particular place. So let's be good sheep. What does the Bible say about sheep? We, they, they know the voice of their shepherd. And, and that's interesting because if you do research on sheep, which I have done, and I think I've said this to you before, um, I actually, there's a paper written by a wildlife a uh, specialist at the University of Illinois, he talks about sheep behavior. He says, one of the sheep, things sheep do is sheep make friends. Maybe another sheep. You get two sheep. So where one, the one friend sheep goes, the f other sheep will follow. And the research actually makes mention, it alludes to that verse I just quoted, that, um, that sheep also make friends with the people who take care of them. And they know the voice of the one that takes care of them. And so when danger comes, or they recognize that the good comes from the friend, so when that person shows up, starts talking, I go towards them because food's coming. Or I go towards them because they're taking me somewhere safe. That's what the good sheep do. We, uh, we listen to the shepherd. So as we, as we pray about welcoming Chris back after sabbatical, how can we be good sheep and be attentive to the shepherd that's been called by God to ministry, but also called by this congregation to be here as pastor? The second thing is, uh, how can we watch out for the wolves? Uh, and I don't, I don't think there are any here at Williams, but Jesus says to his men, as you go, there are going to be some wolves. I'm sending you out like a lamb, like lambs among the wolves. The friend I mentioned, <laughs> the friend I mentioned to you earlier from my, one of my previous churches who often had lists of things that were not done to her specifications, um, after I was, as I was preparing to leave that church, someone asked me honestly in a public sit setting, um, were people not nice to you here at times? Was anybody ever mean to you? And I answered honestly. I said, yes, there were people in my um, perception, my, the way I perceived it, they were mean to me. 
The next morning, she met me in my office and she tore into me. You tell me one person who has been mean to you in this church. One name. You tell me. No one's been mean to you in this church. I, I just, I almost, it was, it was everything I could do to keep from laughing. And what I said to her, and if it was the right thing to say or not, was, I wonder if your anger over my saying that says something about, you know, you. <laughs> and why it makes you so mad. It's like that meme that goes around sometimes that says every family has a crazy aunt or a crazy uncle, and if you don't know who the crazy aunt and crazy uncle are, it's probably you. I don't think there are any wolves here, but the Bible says there's likely to be wolves out there. And my experience tells me that some people don't even know they're wolves. And so we, as faithful friends, faithful followers of Christ and friends of our pastor, of your pastor, need to be those who watch for the wolves. And when they come, you don't stand still and you don't keep quiet. You go and protect your pastor. That's another thing sheep do as well. It's interesting, sheep, uh, Chris can be compared to the shepherd of his flock, but he's also a sheep in the, in the flock of God. And one of the other things sheep do when danger comes, they bunch up because there's safety in numbers. And they move away from the danger and they bunch up. So when the wolves come, uh, be, put Chris in the middle and bunch up around him. He's not, he's not perfect. You're not perfect. This church is, no one is perfect. We are all doing our best to faithfully serve the Lord. And part of that, I think, as you welcome him back, is to be watchful for the wolves, be vigilant in the protection of your pastor. And the last thing is this. It's more of a word about hospitality. Because whether, we, whether it says it or not, a lot of what's going on in this scripture is about hospitality. And it cannot be overstated how different, or really how important, Hospitality was in Jesus' day. Uh, and you may have heard this before. Really, it wasn't like about, we think of hospitality, like I'm going to invite you over to my house and we're going to have dinner together and then you're going to go away. <laughs> um, but in, in this context, uh, it, was a, it was a process. Hospitality was a, was, a, was a process by which somebody, a stranger, was invited in and at the end of the process, they were transformed into friendship. And you can do some research on it. It's very interesting to read. I won't go into everything, but... Even the foot washing ceremony, that ritual, was, was one of the introductory steps of hospitality. I'm not saying wash, well, don't, don't wash, you do not have to wash Chris's feet when he gets back. You can if you want to. I'm not saying you need to. But I'm saying to pay attention uh, to the rituals and the way um, we, we, we create and craft hospitality. It doesn't happen by accident. And I experience you, and I know Terry does, as this is a welcoming and warm and wonderful place to be, and I will come back here every time you extend the invitation. Because that's how good you are and how much fun it is to be with you. And, but in some ways, our pastors are always invited as strangers, right? You've been in this church. Your grandparents were in this church. Your aunt and uncle were in this church. Your, 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 your neighbor who's like an aunt or uncle has been in this church. You're not going anywhere. This is where you, who you are and where you are from. And I know from... Personal testimony from Barry Howard and Mike Oliver um, that you are good to your pastors. I know it from here from Chris as well. But as we think about welcoming um, Chris back in from sabbatical, thinking about how we can even do it better. Ways that we can be affirming and, um, and, and kind. One of the things about hospitality, scriptural hospitality, is that when you come and a stranger arrives, strangers can be dangerous. Stranger danger, right? So unless they welcome them in, uh, the stranger can also be in danger from the community. But the host extends their protection. To offend the stranger in my house is to offend me. What a gift it would be to take that kind of protection and place it over our pastors. No, they're not perfect. No one is. But out of hospitality, out of the kind of hospitality Jesus is calling us to, we're going to extend protection as if you were one of my own. And, and hospitality, and this is where I'm going to land the plane, uh, Jesus is all throughout this passage and all throughout the thread of Jesus' ministry. If you read Jesus' ministry, you don't see him walk into somebody's house and heal somebody without being first asked to heal them. 
You don't see Jesus going into people's houses, even sitting at the table of a tax collector or a sinner and condemning them while he's eating their bread. He stays silent until they ask him for something. Because Jesus was living by the strict codes of hospitality in his day. It was important to him. It was important to him enough to put it in the instructions to those who already knew it. Don't go house hopping. Go and be a good stranger in the home. Stay uh, with that host who has extended hospitality to you. We all know the story of uh, Jesus turning water into wine. It's a story of hospitality. It was a great embarrassment to the host to have run out. And so Jesus creates it. If you know the story, you remember the, someone in the story saying, wow, they saved the best wine for last. It was normally customary to put the best wine first and the bad wine last when no one notices. But they said, this person, Jesus not, didn't, didn't just whip up some wine. He whipped up the best wine. And Jesus says, when people don't welcome you in as they should, and you take it out in the street and take off your sandal and shake the sand off of it. So you don't have the sand of that place stick to you. And Jesus says, it's going to be worse for them on that day than it was for Sodom. And we all know what happened to Sodom, right? And the interesting thing about that is it says something about with all the horrible things that were going on in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that we could read about, one of the greatest sin that Jesus is comparing is the lack of hospitality. If you know the story, angels visit and the men of the city wish to do harm to them. When, when the rule was protection by the host. That's what's happening in the story, right? The host of the home was trying to protect the men. And lots of horrible things. You could talk about lots of days about that story. But Jesus says, for their lack of hospitality was the why Sodom fell, and it will be worse for them, worse for the town that, you, um, that denies you than for Sodom. And that's saying something, right? So friends, my challenge to you, my prayer for you in these next two weeks before Chris, Chris will be standing right here on July the 21st, right? Between now and then, will you pray about how to be the best possible sheep in this, in this flock? Will you pray about how you may be personally vigilant against the wolves, foreign and you know, from the, in the interior or the exterior, wherever those wolves are coming from, will you be vigilant against them and watch after and protect your pastor? And friends, will you pray about how you can be, uh, how you can provide the gift of hospitality in the way that Jesus calls us all to do? But Chris and Sally may never doubt that this is home. These people love me. They've got our back. Amen? Amen. Amen.